speak on soluble lutein and how it affects on retinal damage. Um, so far, this will be a new topic for you. So far, we have heard of non-invasive techniques. We have seen oxidative stress, inflammation since this morning, and also how the animal models will be used for this uh, type of uh, research work. I am a nutritionist, so now I am bringing to you um, a new aspect, how nutrition also helps for your retinal damage and how we can prevent this, especially in diabetes. So I used a streptogetesin model here. This is a basic clinical research, and we are still, uh, a lot of research work is ongoing. I, I work for the company, um, the Omniactive Health Technologies, so I had to disclose myself, um, whatever the opinions and views, it is from me, uh, not from any other professional organizations. The reason is I work for different professional organizations in their committees. So whatever I'm going to say about the results or the interpretation of the results are not belong to the professional societies. As we all know, the diabetes is right now not only as a chronic disease, but it is becoming like an epidemic. Um, as you can see, the numbers keep on growing the evidence that it is not only for certain regions of the world, but it is coming to every country. Either it is in children or in the adults. So it's quite common right now. You will see childhood obesity, and they will go for pre-diabetic condition, insulin resistance condition, and then they are moving forward for the type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, you can see the Asian country is not the only one that is getting the prevalence, but now the North America is also getting into that extent. So now it is spreading like an epidemic rather than a chronic condition. So one of the complications, as you all know, I don't need to discuss about the diabetes and the diabetic complications. So we already know that there are three microvascular complications, diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. So today I'm going to focus on diabetic retinopathy, which is the most commonly seen, especially for diabetic patients, because it's a progressive disorder. So the patients may come up with um, glycemic control in the first, in the beginning of their year, but as the disease progresses, you are going to see there is a mismanagement or the management of hyperglycemia is not constantly uh, taken care by this patient, so they are more prone for this microvascular complications, and especially the diabetic retinopathy. And every year you can see the number of cases are growing up, and more blindness in diabetic patients are quite seen. This is not only common in type 2 um, and also in type 1, 2, but the type 2 diabetes patients are more prone for diabetic retinopathy. So what is diabetic retinopathy? I don't need to discuss because you're all ophthalmologists, so I'm the nutritionist, so you, you have more uh, background about this. Um, but there will be a fluid leakage as well as um, there will be hemorrhages in the eye because of uh, hyperglycemia. Not only that, there are other factors which we are going to see in detail. So what are the natural history of diabetic retinopathy? So these are the conditions. If we can take care at the preliminary stage, the early stage, the mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where the nutrition part will work. But once they come to the moderate and severe and very severe, we are out of control. So that is the reason we always focus on nutritional management during the first period of the uh, conditions of any disease. And diabetic retinopathy and sight-threatening um, conditions. Uh, this is the global prevalence based on the PubMed research. So we looked at some of the studies up to 2012, and um, you can see the diabetic retinopathy is also increasing 34.6%, that is 92.6 million cases. So this is a small si slide uh, that I want to show the difference between the normal retina and diabetic retinopathy and how we can diagnose this diabetic retinopathy in the diabetic cases. So you can see the neovascularization as well as the cotton wool spots, which is the main conditions, that, uh, and also the microaneurysm. So these conditions might be due to several risk factors that may come up during the diabetic condition. And the proliferation, the neovascularization and hemorrhage. Right now, we have a lot of research going on on this area. The reason is the people who are diabetic may also prone for cardiovascular disease. So this is quite common even in cardiovascular disease having the diabetic condition. So what are the factors that are contributing for diabetic retinopathy? Hyperglycemia, hypertension, inflammatory dyslipidemia. We have seen the oxidative stress also this morning, and apoptosis. 
and certain release and suppression of growth factors and hormonal influences and inflammatory cytokines, which we are going to see in my study too. So now I'm coming back to my nutritional aspect. So we know that carotenoids may help um, for certain conditions, for especially for the retina. You might have heard of uh, the recent papers, ERITS-2. Have you heard of that? Um, so th this is a big study where they looked at the lutein, the carotenoids and the lutein and zeaxanthin and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but in the retina, we have three carotenoids, which is uh, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. Sometimes people will call it as zeaxanthin isomers, which is having zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. All these are found in uh, plants and fruits. So as we all know, um, we don't meet our current recommendation dietary guidelines of fruits and vegetables. So we all the time behind the dietary guidelines recommendation for fruits and vegetables. That may be one of the factor for low carotenoid intake in the diet. Um, this is a pathway that was published in 2012 that there might be certain role of lutein where you can see the, how the oxidative stress will be inhibited by this lutein, which is a carotenoid, um, especially present in the eye, and how we can downstream certain uh, regulatory genes where we can protect the eye as well as the DNA damage. And recent studies, um, some of the recent studies are showing something related to brain and retinopathy too. So the people who are having the diabetes, and if you give supplementation of lutein, they also improve the cognitive function. We, we don't know how it is, so we don't have the mechanism of action. But there might be certain stages where we can uh, pay certain attention, like rhodopsin, and also some uh, neurotropic action of the growth factors. So that is the reason we still need more studies on lutein and brain health, but however, there are a lot of established signs right now. Um, so right now, I looked at the PubMed. We have um, at least 70 clinical trials, human clinical trials. And we have 10,000 human subjects were studied, which includes normal healthy subjects as well as um, age macular degeneration, cataract. And this includes both genders, younger and older population, and all the studies are from US as well as overseas. And there are supplementation intervention trials with lutein alone, and also in conjunction with zeaxanthin. So they looked at six milligrams 240 milligrams doses in these intervention trials. So that is an interesting aspect. And there are no side effects so far reported in those studies. And the study duration is from acute to chronic interventions. And they looked at the outcome measures, plasma serum, MPODs, as well as um, all the visual performance tests. So coming to my study. So I looked at the effects of lutein in streptozeotocin diabetic rat. Can I improve the retinal degeneration, which is happening in early stage of uh, diabetic model? So this is an animal model. I don't want to extrapolate the results to human studies because we still need more studies to establish the role of lutein and diabetes. But however, we can have certain um, basic research data here. So I have four groups, diabetes, control, as well as um, the regular lutein, which doesn't have the other zeaxanthin isomers. But the soluble lutein, which is said to be the Lutamax that I used in the study, which is having lutein and zeaxanthin isomers. We looked at the gross structural alterations. Um, this study was conducted at the National Institute of Nutrition, Indian Council of Medical Research in India. Um, so you, you can see the diabetes, how the gross structural alterations happens in diabetes. And then after regular lutein, also you can see the changes but soluble lutein really improved the total retinal thickness. And we also looked at the um, uh, ERG uh, with the supplementation as well as in the diabetic model. So you can see the improvement. The lutein tr treatment minimized the deterioration and also improved the OPs. So as we moved on to uh, some of the gene expression analysis. So we looked at the mRNA gene expression as well as the immunohistochemistry and the fluorescence here. We looked at the rhodopsin. The rhodopsin is also um, improved with the lutein supplementation. We also looked at the nerve growth factor. We, we still need to do a lot of research work on this. This is the basic research. Um, so, but, but we have some significant findings that we can proceed further how we can use for the human clinical trials. 
So we have an improvement with the soluble lutein as well as regular lutein here when compared with the diabetes. And the hypoxia, inducible factor alpha, which is expressed as low oxygen concentration, which uh, is essential in cellular and systemic responses, you can see the improvement uh, with the both lutein. But the soluble lutein is better than the regular lutein. We also looked at the GFAP, which is an intermediate filament in retinal glial cells. Um, so we are thinking to move forward for further research on this area too. And we also looked at the vascular endothelial growth factor, um, actually, which stimulates the vascular genesis as well as angiogenesis. Uh, the beta actin, which is um, considered as the control here, and we compared for all the treatment groups. So based on the data that we have, um, so these are the general statements as a nutritionist that we always make. We had to maintain the glycemic control because we have seen the diabetes will induce the retinal degeneration. So if we can intensive our glycemic control, we can protect our eyes. And also the tight blood pressure control and comprehensive eye examinations quite often. So what are the public health aspects that we have to do? Um, we had to visit the doctors as well as the retinal uh, eye examinations. We had to maintain our body weight, check your blood glucose levels as well as the EKG. So these are the public health importance that we have to pay attention for the quality of the life, especially for the diabetes, because they will be, become de depressed. Because it's a progressive disorder, they, have, they think that there is no treatment for them, even though they are on the glycemic control. So the public health education is very important and also increase awareness of the disease condition. I would like to thank the National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad, as well as the Omni Actors in India. Thank you so much. Uh, this paper is now open for questions. Um, as far as the dose is concerned, right now we don't have a particular dose, but we think that it might be 5 is to 1 ratio of lutein and zeaxanthin because all the three macular carotenoids are available in the retina. So they are thinking that it should be 5 is to 1. Yes, that is an interesting aspect. Um, actually, um, the study duration is for 12 weeks. So the study duration is not enough to see the glucose control. There is a trend of decrease, but there is no significant difference between the groups. Um, we looked at the glucose, lipids, as well as HbA1c2. Um, we have a trend of decrease in lutein supplementation, but the significance is not up to the point. So we, we, we are thinking maybe we need more. Um, intervention time. Right. So we have a trend of decrease. So that might be an indication, but not significant results. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>